It's a nice sunny day and I decided to try a different cheesecake factory, this time in Woodland Hills, California. However, I couldn't resist ordering the same dish, herb crusted salmon with mashed potatoes, asparagus, and lemon sauce. And it was just as good as the one in Santa Monica. If it isn't broke, why fix it? In fact, it was so good, I think I'll try to make this one at home. I'm sure I can figure out how to cook the fish and make mashed potatoes. I just need to get the ingredients for the lemon sauce. Okay, now that I'm full, let's go feed some of our friends by the lake. Duck is the common name for numerous species of waterfowl, generally smaller and shorter neck than swans and geese, which are members of the same family but not considered ducks. The word duck comes from an old English word meaning diver, which I presume is from their ability to submerge themselves, which is fun to watch. Ducks generally only have one partner at a time although the partnership usually only lasts for one year. In Celtic culture, duck symbolism is linked to migration and transition. They're a figure of resourcefulness, honesty, and simplicity. Ducks can live both on water and land, and so it's considered a symbol of intuition, flexibility, and high perceptions. Each element has its meaning. The earth is grounded and stable, water is connected to emotions, so a duck's meaning represents balance. In Scotland, we find the duck symbolism in the coat of arms. And an Irish folktale speaks of a saint by the name of Coleman who passed away, and near his graveyard, there was a well that carried his name, and there used to be a pond there as well, in which a flock of ducks lived. It was said that these birds were under his protection and nobody could harm them. If anyone tried to kill and eat them, they'd either be unsuccessful or even die. I've been told by some of my friends that live on a farm near Staffordshire that ducks can also give egg-laying chickens a run for their money and are a friendly barnyard animal that enjoy living in family groups. Staffordshire is a county in England steeped in legends and well known for being a top destination for family outings because of its beautiful countryside. There are many flowing rivers that run through the county as well as a thriving brewing industry. The town is still home to a number of great breweries so it makes sense that there's also many historical and well-loved pubs. Now as we casually glide over the tranquil countryside, I'd like you to pay attention to the topography. Notice the size of the trees, their spacing from one another, and particularly the architecture in terms of the height of the structures. How many stories are the buildings and homes, as this will become relevant shortly. While I've never been to the UK myself, although I very much would like to visit one day, I imagine that on a clear night, one can see many stars, as there doesn't seem to be many street lamps or city lights. Of course, I'm assuming it would be a clear night, and I know England is known for its gloomy weather compared to places like Los Angeles, but if an object were to hover low, below the clouds, for example, near the rooftop of one of these homes, it would be quite visible. 
especially if it was lit up or giving off its own luminescence. Which brings us to an interesting case that allegedly took place here in 1954 on a relatively clear night in Staffordshire where a woman named Jessie Rosenberg claimed to have been a witness to an encounter with a UFO. And what makes this case particularly noteworthy is that there was an object hovering in the air, which was very common all over the world in the early 50s, including one famous sighting right over the White House in 1952. But what made this case fascinating was that Jesse claimed the saucer-shaped craft, which she described as appearing like a Mexican hat, was so close that she could visibly, with the naked eye, see the occupants inside looking back at her. I was not that surprised to hear her detailed description of the occupants, as this was the most common description given by contactees following World War II, where off-world visitors were said to resemble Nordic-looking people. So let's listen to Jessie's account in her own words, which was broadcast by the BBC in a 1977 special on unidentified flying objects. Staffordshire's had a whole crop of flying saucers. Spots in the sky, lights in the sky, strange things. But the strangest of all was seen one day over this cottage. Mr. and Mrs. Rustenberg were living there, quietly, out in the country. And, well, what, you just tell me what you saw. Well, this was one ordinary day. I was waiting for my husband to come home from work and my two sons went to Cypher to school and I was getting changed and I heard this terrific noise. It was just like a giant cauldron of water being poured onto a, a fire. A shh sort of noise, you know. And my first reaction was, oh, the children. I thought maybe a plane was crashing or something like that. And I uh, slipped my jumper on and went outside to find my two sons lying flat on the ground in the garden in front of the house, shouting, Mummy, Mummy, there's a flying saucer. Well, naturally, I just said, come on, don't be stupid. Come in the house. But felt sort of a strange sensation. Uh, went in my way up the side of the house to where we had a pump where we used to get all our water from and um, automatically looked up to see this all I can describe this huge Mexican hat it was stationary this thing and it was bright silver in color and it had a dome a dome it was tilted to sort of I could see the occupants in it you saw people in it? I saw people in it. There were two people in there. Um, these people were beautiful people. That's the only way I can des describe them. Um, they had long golden hair, like a page, bo page boy bob, just like the old kings. You used to see photographs of the old kings. And the, the color of the hair was golden. Now, I was really... What I, were they dressed in? They, they had a sort of a pole neck jumper affair like a skeet top suit mm. in, in pale blue now these people weren't sat behind one behind the other they were sat together but this whatever it was was tilted so that I could see them and they could see me were you looking at them through windows through portholes um, or no not portholes it was just sort of the like a cockpit I suppose that had this perspect or glass or whatever it was they could see me anyway and I could see them and um, they were uh, they had beautiful faces I shall never forget their faces as long as I live their foreheads seemed to be a, a bit larger than you know the the bottom of their faces as as normal people you would expect to see but um, maybe this is what was just the whatever they had around their heads which was like a transparent fishbowl and they just looked, and I was absolutely paralytic with fear. I couldn't move, although my mind was ticking over. And they looked so sympathetic that I was just mesmerized for what seemed to be 
oh, ages, but it could have only been seconds. And I turned to sort of look down at the boys, was unaware that they were with me because I was so absorbed. And the next thing I looked up and it was gone. How low had it been? It had been the, the height, I couldn't tell you. But the house that you've seen, it was just on top of the roof. It was hovering on top of the, the roof. How big was it compared with the size compared, of the house? It, it, it swallowed the, the whole circumference of, of the roof. I couldn't see. The roof was completely blotted out. The chimneys I couldn't see. All I could see was this massive uh, object that I described as a, like a Mexican's hat, a Mexican hat without the bubbles. And then it flew away sideways or upwards? No, or? I, I didn't see. I just looked up and it had gone. But I assume it went straight up. Because for a short while after in the sky, I looked around and I said to my two boys, well, can you see anything? Can you see anything? And they said, there it is, Mum. And they pointed up and I watched it. It was just like a little cotton meal in the sky. And it circled us three times. It went round three times and then it just shut off. And that was it. When I started to analyse my, myself afterwards, uh, I feared that I might have had a, a hallucination. But then I knew I, I hadn't had because my sons were so sure about what they'd seen and what I'd seen. And I went, it went through my mind that it was a secret uh, weapon from Russia. And then I thought, well, it can't be that because if they had something like that, they wouldn't need to fear anybody or anything. Were you but, scared by it? Did you run indoors? Oh, I was petrified. I couldn't move. I couldn't move a muscle. I was paralyzed with fear. But um, now I wouldn't be. Because now, when I look back, you know, I think, what, what, what an amazing thing to have happened, and for me to have seen it. And when your husband came home, where were you? Well, when my husband came home from the office, I was locked in the house with my children, under a big kitchen table that we were using. Under the table? Under the table, yes. It's funny now, when I look back, you know, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but this is the truth. This happened. And that's it. We were ridiculed, it was very embarrassing at the time, and people, they, they possibly thought, oh, she's a nutter, but you know, who cares? It, this is something that's happened to me, and I'm a practically minded person, and that's it. I find it interesting that she would consider the possibility that the craft may have belonged to the Soviet Russians, but quickly discounted that possibility as with such technology, surely they would have taken over the world by now. That said, the idea that the craft may have belonged to Germans, let alone nationalist Germans, did not even enter her mind. And why would it, as Germany had been thoroughly carpet bombed into oblivion by the Allies, and were fortunate to not have been nuked as well, as the Allies killed 15 million German civilians, and were experts at invading other faraway lands and killing everyone. But only up until 1945, as in 1946 and 1947, when they invaded Antarctica during what is known as Operation High Jump, the Allies suffered a decisive military defeat by what many people 75 years later suspect were a subterranean German colony which never surrendered like the rest of Germany but instead escaped with their alleged anti-gravitic technology which historians refer to as Foo Fighters and retreated to Antarctica where they established a breakaway civilization which was impervious to the inferior weapons of the official winners of World War II. There's no question that Germany lost World War II, and it's a very different place today, which is still occupied by 50,000 U.S. troops and acts as a vassal state to the Americans, which dictate a new globalist political agenda based on ideology that calls for no borders, no gender, and no race a demoralized society without any connection to its history, culture, 
or the actual events before, during, and immediately following the Second World War. That said, Jesse, who's in her 90s now, did not suspect that the UFO phenomena could be connected to the Aryan elite that escaped the Nuremberg trials and instead continue to exist covertly, exercising their technological superiority with impunity in the skies above not only the United States, but the UK. Even today, she does not seem to connect the blonde inhabitants of the craft to the blonde Germanic adversaries her nation faced a few short years before her sighting in 1954. The illustration. And the face is a slim either side. Um, a lot slimmer. Beautiful. Would that be why the Gavin Gibbons, when he did the illustration, yeah. I think it was a UFO News or something, that that was a lot thinner in the face. Yeah, that's right. Right. Sorry about that, Jesse. I haven't realised. So we're uh, Dawn's interrupting that's with right. a cup of tea. Come on then, Dawn. <laughs> the saucer was no longer there, but a few minutes later we saw it circle the house three times mm. before it shot up was like a rocket against the blue of the dark in the sky. Uh, quite true. Yeah, thank you. I've been speaking on this topic for quite some time now and have found that to most people it seems like science fiction. Of course, most people also never stop to consider that the genre of science fiction itself is often based on some degree of truth and in many cases steeped in government propaganda as Hollywood, like NASA, is to a large degree influenced and restricted by intelligence agencies which prefer to withhold certain technological advancement from the public in the name of national security. The controlled media has been effective in dictating the narrative as the modern UFO phenomena started during World War II on a national scale with the Battle of Los Angeles in 1942, which I covered in a recent video, and yet people in the early 50s rarely suspected an Earth-based breakaway civilization as they were more concerned with the possibility of people from other worlds. At least, that's what the media seemed most interested in. In Washington, ghost-like objects dart across the radar screen at the CAA Traffic Control Center at National Airport for several hours, traveling more than 100 miles an hour. Air Force jet fighters spend several hours chasing the objects plotted on the radar scope. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. Major Keyhole, as author of the book Flying Saucers Are Real, what is your opinion of these new sightings of unidentified objects? With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. As these sightings of disc-shaped craft increased in the years following the Roswell incident of 1947, so did reports of interactions with the occupants of these craft, which oftentimes seemed to be tall, blonde, human-like aliens. 
There's the Billy Myers case, where the alleged E.T. race seemed to be very attractive and the primary contact being a blonde Nordic looking woman. Another famous case was George Adamski, whose photos and video of the UFOs shared a striking resemblance to images leaked out of the former Soviet Union of saucer-like craft that were obtained by the Red Army as it invaded Berlin. While the latter models were called Hanabu, the early prototypes were called Vril. The crafts were named Vril, and Vril in Germanic language means the life force. Basically, craft utilizing the never exhaustible, always automatically replenishable life force. And then in a book on Asian occult, German occult traditions, they had a chart of the runic characters, and this is the runic character for the life force. So it all drives together. The name of the craft, Vril, uh, the meaning of the word Vril, and the pictorial symbol on the bottom all mean the same thing, the life force. So <coughs> we were able to decipher this little puzzle here. 17 of the Vrils were produced, quite probably they were tested quietly, low-key testing, and then they were flown uh, to the German South Polar Colony. We will talk about it in detail pretty soon. And these are low-level photographs, the first real photographs of uh, such craft in low-level flights over the testing grounds in Germany. It's probably the autumn of 1944, the leaves are gone from the trees. In this photograph, we can see the head of the pilot through the transparent perspex cupel of the craft. A very steep maneuver. Possibly the craft is moving in this direction upward because of all the edges, these and these edges are blurred. This happens usually with the edges, with the attacking and the trailing edge of the craft. Parts of the drive. In this enlarged photograph, we see an even better picture of the pilot inside. These two dark spots here could be the sunglasses that the pilot was wearing. Uh, the craft could go 2,900 uh, two, <laughs> kilometers in the atmosphere, almost two times the speed of sound. It definitely had uh, exoatmospheric and orbital capabilities. Uh, and I have a suspicion that these were free energy craft that did not need any fuel to fly. Once they were started and put in motion, I mean their gravity drives were activated, they did not need any, uh, any more fuel to run. And uh, we can see low level flights, probably the autumn, early autumn of 44, the, the, the leaves are still on the trees. Uh, this visible uh, asymmetricity here, if we divide the craft, it looks like the cabin has been blown backward by a strong wind, or it's kind of a cake melting in our uh, refrigerator, <laughs> just taken out of the fridge. Bigger craft, the Hollywood two type craft, which were 25 meter diameter, about 75 meter diameter uh, tank killers were also produced. They had one big drive, a ball in the middle, which was a tachyon drive, uh, an electromagnetogravitic uh, drive, which they were calling the tachyon drives. The Thule, the Thule tachyonators, the Thule tachyon drives were produced on assembly lines. They had an assembly line production of tachyon drives in their AEG and Siemens plants in 44 and 45. So in these underground caverns, they had more than enough space and fantasy and guts to build all these uh, incredible flying machines. Uh, armaments were added. These are machine guns in three turrets. <coughs> On this photograph, we see some of the armaments here clearly visible. Something is sticking menacingly from the underside of the craft. A shot from the underside shows uh, the 
Love Buffett Cross, either the four legs or four small machine gun turrets, and something that looks very suspicious, something here that we would see very soon resembles like a tank turret with a gun sticking out. These were really the uh, tank killers of the Hollywood II type. They were designed to fight whole tank armies. Uh, the skeptics would say, well, it's impossible to, what a stupid idea, uh, it's impossible to put a tank turret on a saucer because it would never lift off. A tank turret is about 10, 15 tons. It's alone is two thirds or maybe half the weight of the tank. However, the Germans claimed that these craft were 100 tons in weight, armed with brute steel plates. They did not have developed at the time the force field shields around the craft that they developed later on. That's why they were relying on brute uh, steel armor. While more and more people are giving serious consideration to the idea that nationalist Germans managed to develop or obtain what effectively can be considered free energy craft, the German scientists themselves seem to imply that they had help from similar looking people from other worlds. That is to say, before the Germans allegedly broke away to Antarctica and South America, assuming that indeed took place, these paperclip scientists seem to imply that prior human civilizations either already broke away to colonize space, or maybe we ourselves are the offspring of a prior colonization, meaning we ourselves did not originate on Earth. Now, as an anthropologist, this theory, as outlandish and outrageous as it sounds to some of you, conveniently answers many puzzles for people like me that spent many years learning about scientific frauds, such as the Piltdown Man or Nebraska Man, two debunked missing links, the first being a fake and the latter being a misidentified pig's tooth. Humanity having a celestial, non-native origin would make it no longer necessary for a desperate anthropologist to do all this mental gymnastics to force obsolete paradigms to work, like out of Africa theory, which involves claims that an ape-like foot with a big toe that sticks out to the angle like a thumb, obviously used for grabbing branches, was actually a bipedal hominin ancestor displayed in many museums. Not only do I have a problem with the simian anatomy that some anthropologists try to pass off as bipedal, meaning upright walking, nothing that walked upright like we do had all that fur. Unlike apes and monkeys, we sweat a lot. And there's an explanation for this, which has to do with how bipedal hominins hunted. People cannot outrun most animals, like a gazelle, for example, which can reach speeds of up to 60 miles per hour in short bursts, but it cannot sustain that for hours. People, however, can run for long periods of time, and this is demonstrated in marathon runners, where sweating becomes a necessity to be able to cool off after running down animals right before plunging a weapon into its exhausted body. So these upright, bipedal, hairy specimen with hands as feet, allegedly almost human, are paleo art and created to push a political agenda, not a scientific one. All aspects of the out of Africa theory lacks empirical evidence, from how races came to be, to the hominin origins coming from tree dwellers. No ancient origin myth or religion attributes our start to monkeys. Many of them, in fact, claim that apes evolved from us, where the common ancestor took to the trees after some sort of global cataclysm and instead of the other way around. If this sounds counterintuitive to you, it's now being proposed by members of the scientific community 
so it's worth taking a look for yourself since the media has no incentive to report on such things. That said, the revolution in genomics since the sequencing of DNA from all races, including archaic hominin races, which is a fancy way of saying ancient people, has demonstrated that we are all made up of various species of people that had different blood types, were adapted to different environments, but that does not answer the pivotal question, if we did not come down from the trees, where did humanity come from? Turning to myth and folklore, we have stories of people dwelling in subterranean habitats coming to the surface, such as the Hopi Indian legends. And I have several videos on Inner Earth which explores if it's even possible. And of course, there's no shortage of ancient mythologies and religious stories of some sort of fallen angel or God coming down and mating with earthly or mortal women. From the book of Enoch to the many stories of Zeus or some other God constantly raping women and their offspring establishing new civilizations, which is how Atlantis allegedly started. Not to mention Crete and the Minoan civilization with Zeus and Europa, the Phoenician princess where Europe gets its name. The genetic findings seem to make much more sense in terms of an advanced branch of humanity hybridizing with more primitive or less technologically advanced cousins, which might sound implausible to some, but at least starts to solve mysteries such as Rh negative blood type, which modern traditional Darwinian anthropology has no solution for. People all over this planet for at least 6,000 years have been influenced by extraterrestrials. They have taken the information that is in essentially every school on the planet and they've modified the information. All history documentation in this country and on every country on the planet have been given lies about astronomy, lies about mathematics, lies about uh, uh, technical uh, capabilities, lies about the universe, you name it, okay? Everything have been lies. Every PhD on this planet, whether they're scientific, whether they're medical, makes no difference. Every book that they read the six years they were in the university are lies. They're not telling the truth. They were not taught the truth. The Secretary of the Navy was aware of this because he had been contacted by Nordic extraterrestrials. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.